my fellow Singaporeans. Good afternoon. In almost every general election since independence, the PAP has held a rally near Fullerton. We usually hold it after the midpoint of the campaign. It's an occasion to pause, take stock of what has happened in the hustings so far, and refocus everyone's minds on what is at stake. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we cannot convene a physical Fullerton rally this year. So I have to speak to you virtually, online. But my purpose is the same. Hardly ever in our history have the stakes been higher than now. We are in the middle of a crisis. But as tough as the past months have been, our biggest challenges lie ahead of us. Globally, COVID-19 cases continue to surge. We don't know how the pandemic will end or whether a lasting solution will be found, be it a vaccine or more effective treatment. We face a continuing danger to public health. And this will also weigh heavily on the economy for perhaps a year if not longer. All our experience since the beginning of this year has made clear just how important a good government is to fight COVID-19, support the economy, and get out of this crisis intact. This is what this election is about. Whom do you trust to get you through the very difficult times ahead? Our COVID-19 situation is stable. Our healthcare system has held up well. Our fatality rate is among the lowest in the world. In the migrant worker dormitories, the outbreak is being systematically cleaned up. We have managed to get to this stage, not by chance, but by dint of immense effort. First, We've been preparing for a pandemic since SARS. We systematically built up our resources and capabilities, stockpiling masks and PPE, training healthcare workers, practicing contact tracing and reporting. For 17 long years, we sustained these preparations. We dealt with H1N1, we prepared for Ebola and MERS, we never took our eyes off the ball. So when COVID-19 hit the region and the world, we had a good base to work off. But every disease is different. COVID-19 is not the same as SARS. It's less lethal, but far more infectious. The post-SARS preparation was essential, but not enough. When COVID-19 hit us, we had to scramble. One challenge was to secure more face masks amidst a worldwide shortage. Another was to ramp up testing so that we could detect new cases faster and stop them spreading. Countries had banned the export of instruments and chemicals needed to run COVID-19 tests. We had to ramp up labs, set up new ones, we had to manufacture more test kits and accurately process the results. We recruited and trained swab teams to perform the thousands of swabs needed every day. Behind the scenes, this was a highly complex operation. For now, test capacity is no longer a constraint for us, but we are still building up reserve testing capacity, just in case. Despite our best efforts in April, the virus broke out in our migrant worker dormitories. The large numbers pose a real risk of overwhelming our hospitals. We had to mount a huge operation. We mobilized the SAF and home team to help manage the dormitory situation. We even opened up SAF camps to house vulnerable workers and keep them safe. 
we arrange for every worker to be fed, cared for, and paid on time. We built new isolation and medical facilities. Within weeks, we created almost 30,000 bed spaces in the Changi Expo at PSA Tanjung Paga Terminal and elsewhere. More bed spaces than all our acute hospitals put together. All these extremely demanding tasks had to be performed in the fog of war. We had to decide and act urgently based on incomplete information. The public service, including our healthcare workers, the SAF and home team, responded magnificently. They took directions from the multi-ministry task force led by Gan Kim Yong and Lawrence Wong. At every step, we face difficult trade-offs between lives and livelihoods. Crucial decisions had to be made. It was the ministers who made these decisions and were accountable for them. One major decision was whether to impose a circuit breaker. Doing it would come at a great cost to jobs and business. But not doing it meant risking a major outbreak and loss of lives. We had to decide one way or the other before it was obvious, much less certain, that cases would shoot up. It was a big decision. Kim Yong and Lawrence brought the matter to Cabinet. The Cabinet discussed it, weighed the pros and cons, and decided to go ahead. As it turned out, we acted just in time, as the numbers were growing, but before they shot up dramatically. The implementation of the circuit breaker too was not straightforward. How to cushion the huge impact on jobs and incomes? How to do home-based learning for students? How to get Singaporeans to observe the necessary but painful measures? I did a live TV broadcast to explain to Singaporeans why we were imposing the circuit breaker and to ask people to please play your part and stay home. This was a political decision, not an administrative one. The ministers and ultimately the PM and cabinet have responsibility. Without a team of capable ministers working closely together on all these different aspects, we wouldn't have been able to implement the anti-COVID measures. We would have lost the confidence of Singaporeans and you've seen this happen many times elsewhere. Political leaders fail to act competently. Voters lose trust in them. They are confused and dismayed. Their faith in the whole system is shaken. People suffer greatly and many die unnecessarily. Singapore has avoided this. We are in a better position now. But even as we reopen after the circuit breaker, we cannot afford to take chances. The danger is still very much alive. In many countries, after lockdowns were relaxed, cases have flared up again. And if there's a second global wave of the pandemic, we may be hit hard again, despite our best efforts. Keeping COVID-19 under control and our people safe, avoiding another lockdown, will take everything that we've got. We'll have to make many more difficult decisions and find more creative, radical solutions to take care of our people. At this moment of danger and alarm, the opposition parties are talking as if we can just keep to our old ways and the crisis did not exist. They show no recognition that we are facing the crisis of a generation. They've been completely silent on how to tackle COVID-19, both during the last six months and in this election campaign. What contribution will they make in Parliament? Adding contrast to the discussions, they say, if they get elected as MPs. 
what will happen to Singapore if they form the government? Our second major challenge is the economy. We've never been hit so hard before. In a usual year, we have one budget. This year, we've had four, injecting a total of $100 billion almost, far above our normal spending. And that gives you a sense of COVID-19's huge impact on businesses and especially on workers and jobs that we have had to counter. But it is not just about indiscriminately writing checks. We need to understand who is hurting, who needs help mostest, how to help them, what works, what doesn't. In the past months, we've done this systematically. The Job Support Scheme is a major initiative. It costs the government more than $20 billion, but it saves employers a large part of workers' wages and in that way, keeps workers in their jobs. At the same time, we are giving extra support to households and to those who have been more affected, like the self-employed. We also passed emergency legislation for rental and contract waivers. This was an unprecedented move. But if we hadn't done this, contractors who miss project deadlines because of the circuit breaker would have had to pay liquidated damages. Tenants who couldn't do business would still have had to pay rent. Couples who could not hold weddings would have forfeited their deposits for their wedding banquets. Many individuals and SMEs would have been badly hurt, and many good companies would have gone under. We were very fortunate to have a very capable team to pull this off. Minister Shan Mugam and SMS Edwin Tong are both senior counsels. They were helped by the Attorney General, Lucien Wong, who is an outstanding corporate lawyer, and experts from business and law, including lawyers in private practice and officers in the public service. Working frantically, they managed to put this bill together in nine days. Parliament then passed it on a certificate of urgency all three readings in one day. We did it again with a second set of emergency measures two months later. This is the difference that a highly competent government can make to your lives. But all these budgetary and legislative measures are emergency relief. They cannot be sustained indefinitely. The more fundamental solution for jobs is to turn around our economy. We need to create new jobs. To do that, we must attract new investments. And that means maintaining confidence in Singapore so that companies will not lose faith in us in a crisis. Way back in 1985, we were in a similar situation. That year, we experienced a sudden recession Annual GDP growth turned negative for the first time since independence. I had just entered politics. Dr. Tony Tan tasked me to chair the Economic Committee to study how we could lift ourselves out of the recession and reposition our economy for the future. We took decisive emergency measures, including cutting CPF contributions. The younger ministers, including me, held many meetings with union leaders and workers to persuade them. We didn't just make one speech or hold one press conference and expect people simply to swallow the bitter pill. At the National Day rally that year, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew explained to Singaporeans, using charts and tables, why the recession had happened, how Singapore had lost competitiveness, and what we had to do to get out of the recession. People said that Mr. Lee sounded like a professor giving Singaporeans an economics lecture. But Singaporeans understood the message and supported the tough measures. The measures worked, and within a year, our economy was growing again. And 
that is what political leadership is about. Once the situation stabilized, we went on the offensive. I went with EDB on a marketing pitch all over the world to reassure investors, explain to them what we were doing, and bring in more investments for Singapore. We placed a full-page advertisement in the Wall Street Journal with an eye-catching headline. Who would be mad enough to invest in Singapore in a recession? Nowadays, people might call this clickbait. The advertisement carried signatures of nine global heads of multinationals, including Apple, Seagate, and Motorola. And several of these companies are still here today, 35 years later. Why were these MNCs prepared to invest in Singapore during such an economic crisis and to sign on with Singapore? First, they knew Singaporeans were industrious and capable workers, the best workforce in the world. Second, they had experienced our tripartite relationship. Our unions were like no other unions they had encountered anywhere else in the world. Our unions and the NTUC cooperate closely with employers and government to generate growth and jobs for workers. They are not opponents to be counted, but partners in progress. Third, the investors had high regard for our public service. EDB was a one-stop shop where they could settle all their problems. Other countries have one-stop shops too. The difference is that their governments do not work as one. So their one-stop shops cannot make things happen across the government as the EDB can. Fourth, investors knew Singapore had a first-rate government. They had interacted with our ministers. They knew our quality. One of them told one of our ministers, after meeting you, we decided to invest in Singapore. It was sincerely meant and a huge compliment. And finally, the investors knew the government enjoyed Singaporeans' strong support. So the ministers could take decisive steps if needed and make the right decisions to promote job growth and create jobs. Maintaining this high reputation is a matter of survival for all of us. Singapore is a small country with many limitations. You know them by heart. We must show the world that we are indeed special and can sustain our edge over other countries and cities. Then, MNCs will invest in us, other countries will take us seriously, and Singapore has a place in the sun. Otherwise, we will just fade away and be forgotten, like so many city-states in history. The world is watching this election closely. Will we show the world that Singaporeans are still one united people, strongly supporting the leaders they have chosen, and working together to overcome the crisis? Or will we reveal ourselves to be fractious and divided withholding our full support from the government we have elected in a crisis where swift, decisive action is vital to save jobs and lives. Investors will scrutinize the election results and act on their conclusions. And so will others, both friends and adversaries of Singapore. And that's why, in this election, the PAP seeks not just your mandate, but your strong mandate to lead Singapore through this crisis. Meanwhile, what does the opposition have to say about getting us out of the downturn, or growing our economy, or creating new jobs? They prattle on about a minimum wage or a universal basic income. These are fashionable peacetime slogans, not serious wartime plans. How will a minimum wage help somebody who is unemployed? It will just add 
to employers' costs and pressure employers to drop even more workers? How would we pay for a universal basic income? All the GST increases in the world will not be enough. Do you really want to vote for parties who, in a crisis, come up with nothing better than old, recycled manifestos? Last month, the ministers and I did a series of national broadcasts. We sketched out the challenges we were facing and our plans to overcome them. The PAP election manifesto also sets out our program. Can we turn all these plans into reality? That depends. It depends on you giving us a strong mandate, a strong mandate for me and my PAP team. I have worked hard to feel the strongest possible team for this election. It's an experienced team. It includes capable ministers whom I rely on to get things done and to take care of Singaporeans in this crisis. And seasoned, energetic MPs who will look after you in every constituency, speak up for you in Parliament, and make sure the PAP government is focused on your needs and aspirations. It's also a team refreshed and reinforced with a younger generation of promising leaders from all walks of life. They will bring new ideas and perspectives on tackling the challenges ahead. And I hope the younger first-time voters will identify with them and see them as candidates who represent their views and will advance their interests. My duty as PM is not just to take good care of Singapore during my time in office. It's also to prepare new generations of leaders who can take over from me and my older colleagues and lead Singapore into a different future. And that's why this time the PAP is fielding 27 new candidates, a record number. But to serve you, we first need to get elected. Your MPs and ministers have done their best. You've seen our track record. If you think we've delivered and made your life better, please vote for us. If you think we have not, then by all means, vote us out. But do not confuse signals by voting opposition if what you really want is a PAP MP to look after your constituency and town council and a PAP government to look after Singapore. The opposition says they are offering Singaporeans insurance just in case you need it. But don't buy insurance from someone on a promise, especially when you have reason to suspect this company cannot pay out on the insurance and their checks will bounce. With the PAP, you know that when we promise anything, we will deliver. We have walked with Singaporeans for six decades. We first became the government in 1959. The PAP won that crucial first election because we represented the national consensus and our people's collective hopes for their future. After more than 60 years, this hasn't changed. The PAP still reaches out broadly to the population our policies have improved people's lives beyond measure. We've maintained trust with the people, and we've renewed our leadership to keep the party vigorous and in sync with your aspirations. As ESM Go Chok Tong recently put it, we believe in political renewal, not political recycling. I cannot say that such a state of affairs will last forever. But do not undermine a system that has served you well. Look at the countries that change governments regularly. Their political consensus has frayed. After a government falls, what follows isn't a new, more stable equilibrium, but
but more frequent changes of governments and divisive politicking. People appear to have a choice, but often the more things change, the more they remain the same. These countries have not done better than Singapore. So I ask Singaporeans, don't be taken in by those who say that it's important just to have more choices. Look carefully at the choices they offer you. Ask yourself if they can deliver. Don't be taken for a ride. Your future is at stake. This is my seventh Fullerton rally. My first Fullerton rally was in 1984, when I entered politics 36 years ago, age 32. That was a watershed election. The PAP fielded 26 new candidates, and its self-renewal took off. Today, I'm the only one left from the class of 1984. But the party now has many younger cohorts of leaders to take the country forward. In almost every election since 1984, I've returned to speak at the Fullerton rally. Each time, Singapore had made more progress. Over 36 years, the changes have been dramatic. Fullerton Building today is no longer the general post office, but a heritage building restored to more than its old splendor. The Singapore River has been cleaned up. Marina Bay has been transformed from open water and empty reclaimed land into a vibrant downtown alive with business, recreations, and arts, alive with life. We built all this up steadily, despite several crises along the way. In 1984, at Fullerton Square, I had a bit of my speech speaking to young voters as a young man. I looked up what I said, and uh, according to the reports, I said, it's great to be young. Youths do not have to be sane, sober, and subdued. You can stand up, dance, sing, and have fun. But also do things which are worthwhile for society, because a government wants a country which is caring, where citizens are cultivated, and willing to help both neighbors and fellow citizens. I said, please don't go hell riding, but Michael Jackson's music is OK. And I think that message is still a good one for young people from me, 36 years older. Within months of the election, we ran into the sharp 1985 recession and had much more serious issues to talk about than Michael Jackson. Since then, in government, I have experienced the Asian financial crisis, 9-11 terrorist attacks, and the JI threat in Singapore, SARS, and the global financial crisis. Each was a grave challenge. Each time, we worried about the worst happening to us. But each time, the government led from the front. Singaporeans rallied together, and we pulled through. What I did not expect, what no one expected, was to meet this overwhelming crisis in the last stretch of my premiership. But I count myself fortunate to have been elected by you and chosen by my fellow ministers and MPs to lead Singapore through this critical crisis. COVID-19 is the crisis of a generation. It's more complex and more dangerous than any previous crisis we have met. Again, there can be no certainty that things will turn out well. But we must have the same unshakable will to marshal all our energies and resources to fight it together, prevail, and emerge stronger. Our response in this crisis will determine the future of our country and prospects for our children and grandchildren in Singapore. You have my word. 
Together with my older colleagues like Pyo Chi Hien and Taman Shanmugaratnam, as well as the younger 4G ministers, I will see this through. I'm determined to hand over Singapore intact and in good working order to the next team. I have spent all my adult life serving my country because I believe in Singapore. That's why I took a scholarship to serve in the SAF. That's why when ESM Go Chok Tong asked me to enter politics, I agreed. All my life, I felt a deep personal responsibility to do my part to keep Singapore safe and make it succeed. Now, to get through this crisis, I need your help. I cannot do it alone. I need the strongest team we can find to work with me and with you. I also need full support from all of you, from the pioneer and Merdeka generations who have done so much to build this Singapore and want to stay healthy and well for many years to come from parents with children who want to live in a country where their kids have a bright future, from young men and women starting work at a difficult moment, but with their adult lives ahead of them and the country's future in their hands. If we all work together and build well, generation after generation, then another 36 years from now, the Fullerton Rally will be held in a vastly transformed Singapore. And future Singaporeans, today's young ones, can be proud of what they have built. But at this critical moment, Singapore needs a capable government with the full support of a united people more than ever. Have no fear. Instead, be confident. Singapore will endure this searching trial. We will be tested, but we will not be found wanting. My team and I will walk this journey with you. Please vote for us. Vote PAP for our lives, our jobs, our future. Thank you.